excited to share the research that I do, and I'm also really excited to share what motivates me, what's, what I'm passionate about. I'm a spatial ecologist, and I'm interested in the subject of urban biodiversity and maintaining and protecting that urban biodiversity. So why should we care about, about urban biodiversity or diversity in the cities? Well, I'm going I'm to tell you about that, but before I do, I wanted to share a life-changing moment with you. And so it, this moment was at the start of my PhD. I was doing work with a really wonderful group of people down in southern Ontario at uh, near the Long Point region. Bird Studies Canada is the location. And we were doing research on the hood, hooded warbler, which is a species that was listed with threatened status in Canada. So that means it had 500 or fewer breeding pairs. And we were looking for nesting success of the species in a, in a few forested areas in Long Point region. And so I was learning how to nest search. I was looking for the elusive hooded warbler and learning how to nest search from the experts. And even the experts have a hard time finding a nest. So you can search for eight hours in a single day and, and still not find one or find maybe one or two if you're lucky. So I got a search image for the hooded warbler, I learned their call, and then I, I went on my quest to find the elusive bird. And the first day I searched to no avail, didn't see anything, didn't find anything. And it's hot, you're covered in clothes, and it's sweaty, and there's you know mosquitoes all over you. It's southern Ontario, it's like Louisiana swamp land. And so, second day, still no nest. Um, and by the third day, I was really, really determined. So I went to a kind of remote area of the forest that hadn't been really well searched. And I heard the female call, and it was a chipping call. And the hooded warbler is a really beautiful bird. It has a, a bright yellow face and an olive back, olive-sided kind of back. They have little white patches on their tail that they can flash around. And the male has this really sharp, uh, hood. Females sometimes also have a little bit of a hood, but not quite as much. And you can see actually a female sitting on the nest here in, in this slide. And so I, I heard the chip and I looked and found a patch of raspberry thicket, which is where they nest. And I basically checked every single one of those raspberry bushes and couldn't find that nest. And so in my frustration, I just decided to sit down and wait. And, and I waited and waited and waited for what seemed like two hours. And eventually what happened is the female revealed herself to me. That's how I, I looked at it. Because she, she hopped within a few feet of me from little branch to little branch and wound up on the nest, which was actually within a few feet of where I was sitting. So I could have almost trampled that nest um, unawares because I didn't see it even though it was right in front of me. And what that moment really taught me was that sometimes things can be right in front of you and you just, you won't see them. You don't see them because you haven't observed in the way that another species would observe things. And the female, she kind of curiously and cautiously revealed herself to me because I thought she realized I'm not really a threat. And I think that moment really taught me not only to be patient and to be careful, but also that you, know, you, you can be looking at something and you don't see it. And that's the way I view our experience in urban areas. We, we go about our daily lives in urban centers, surrounded by buildings, surrounded by cars, surrounded by a, a very built environment. And we don't really see the wildlife or the creatures that we share this environment with. We have red-tailed hawks that are nesting in downtown Toronto. We have them at the doorstep of Ryerson University, but we don't necessarily see them. How can we make their lives better? So that's one of the interesting questions that I do research on. How can we make the urban biodiversity that we have here better? And you might think, well, Toronto is, is depauperate of, of wildlife. You know, what do we have? Crows and raccoons and that kind of thing. But we do have a lot more, in fact, because cities around the world are developed in those areas that are the richest places on our planet. 
We live in the estuaries, in the coastal regions, we live in the lowlands, and we're attracted to those areas for the very same reasons that other animals are attracted to them. They're the nutrient-rich areas, they're connected to everything else, they have water, they have rich resources. And so you think, well, if I'm going to go see nature, I should go to Algonquin Park, but that's not true. You can go and see nature in Toronto and you will see more bird species in the city than you would in Algonquin Park. It's kind of surprising to, to, to know that. And so in terms of the research that I do, I study what determines where individuals are located. If you think about that word location, business people and real estate agents, they always tell you location, location, location. It's all about location when you're situating a business. And so what I study is, is what determines where individuals are located. And I try to understand why does that location matter on land and in water. And interestingly, as an ecologist, we divide things up into silos. So ecologists tend to be terrestrial ecologists or they're aquatic ecologists. So as a terrestrial ecologist, you study land animals. And as an aquatic ecologist, you study aquatic animals. And there's very few people that are doing research at that interface. In fact, it's one of the most unstudied regions of, of ecology is the terrestrial aquatic interface. So some of the work that I do is looking at land and water interface. When going back to the hooded warbler, on land we know, well, the nest site is important. Why did the female choose that particular nest? We know that the size of the forest patch and the, the dynamics that created that patch, like the mature forest and the death of a single tree, we know that's important. We know that the forest itself is important in the surrounding area and even the location of that forest in southern Ontario because birds actually return to the same uh, forest that they themselves were hatched in to breed. And if you think of you know, cities as these rich, rich environments, all of the creatures were returning back to these rich environments too. Uh, so as an aquatic person, I have made that switch between land and water. I studied birds and now I'm studying aquatic systems more. And when you think about aquatic systems, we know that water flows downstream. So on land, when you think about species diversity, the more land you survey, the more species you get. On water, the more water that is flowing, so the greater the discharge, the greater the species diversity. So it's a, a different way of uh, measuring diversity or finding diversity. So when aquatic systems, what really matters is position. Position in the watershed. Where are you with respect to the headwater systems and with respect to the downstream systems? And one thing that we haven't really looked at is how do land animals respond to watershed position? It's like one of those questions that's really staring you in the face, but surprisingly, nobody studied bird diversity in relation to watershed position. It's a very you know, open question that we're doing research on in my lab. And um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have you connected very much with um, lots of other um, researchers in Ontario who are really turning their focus to questions of urban ecology? And I wondered if you've connected with many colleagues from across the province? Well, yes, indeed, there are, I mean, people study a lot in urban ecology, that's for sure. It's been researched since the 70s, uh, urban ecology, but not necessarily at that land-water interface. Uh, so, yes, there's researchers at University of Toronto, Mark Cadot, and a uh, number of people doing, um, you know, there's, there's proposals underway to develop an urban observatory, for example, and create uh, these research nodes. There's the long-term research um, stations in Baltimore where they study uh, the whole ecosystem, whole urban ecosystem, and also the social science aspect of it. So, yeah. Toronto is massive. Mm -hmm. like, traversing that and collecting data, has there been help or assistance through citizen scientists? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, of course, my research really relies on citizen science. Uh, when I did my PhD research, we collected some of my own or our own data um, at like nesting sites within forested areas around St. Williams Forest. Uh, but you cannot possibly collect enough data to get the to answer the, the bigger picture questions, and that's true in urban systems as well. So uh, when you're studying birds in particular, for example, you have to study them at multiple spatial scales. So not only where is their nesting site located, but how is that forest connected to other forests? And for that kind of research, you need you need citizen science data. So I used, uh, or I rely on things like the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, and that's an atlas that happens every 20 years. So we have thousands of volunteers go out and collect data, you know, on every 10 kilometer square within the province of Ontario. So that those same sites are, um, are sampled by the Toronto Bird um, Observatory. So there's a, a group that goes out as much as yearly to those same locations. And so citizen science data is actually the best kind of uh, data for studying birds. Yeah. You referred to people studying the social science aspects, and I'm just curious, what is that? What are the social science aspects? Things like, you know, why do people want to maintain a perfect lawn, you know, in, in the city when, when in fact it would be a lot easier just to let it go or to, to grow flowers or, or native species that attract butterflies. So aspects of human behavior and how to change those uh, behaviors so that we're, we're actually interacting more with the creatures we share our environment with, yeah. Your studies or your research, do you have to um, change it based on weather? So like since it's land and water, do you find that you collect more data when it, after it rains or during the rain or droughts or anything? Well, that's a good question. I mean, for birds, you have to collect it when it's not raining. So birds are fair weather animals you survey during nice weather because you can't hear them when it's raining uh, and you can't hear them when it's really windy. For aquatic systems, you know, I have uh, some research that's looking at chloride concentrations and, and road salt, the impacts of road salt on, on urban streams. And for that kind of research, it's a bit like chasing storms. So you go out throughout different periods of the year when it's raining, when it's not raining, and determine what the impacts are along the entire watershed. Thank you so much, Stephanie. <laughs>